Good morning, everyone. It's time for our weekly compilation video. Um, this was a shorter week, but we have been discussing neurodivergence and gynecology, specifically looking at um, ADHD, as well as the autism spectrum disorders in terms of um, hormonal functioning, sexual functioning, um, basic gynecology things, kind of everything that's in there. Now, obviously, the preamble to this video is that there is not a lot of data out there about these conditions and this specific topic you know in terms of sexual medicine for example i mean the you know the whole specialty is honestly kind of new ish um and you know these things represent the the there be dragons kind of you know aspect of the map of what's going on with with sexual medicine so there's lots of stuff coming down the pike there's but there's not a lot of of information to to pull data statistics on things like that so um you know uh, if you know something that's not mentioned in this video great let me know you know i always am, am open to discuss things and to learn new things but i do think it's a very important topic to discuss and to really bring to fruition um, the other thing, obviously, is next week is the opening of the Haven Center for Sexual Medicine and Vulvovaginal Disorders. So um, my videos next week will be focused more on uh, my new uh, clinic. So uh, make sure you tune in for those. But otherwise, we'll get started. So, um, you know, the first thing that we looked at was ADHD, or let me back up. So the idea of neurodivergency, your kind of neurodifferential um, processes, comes from this um, thought that patients who have these types of conditions are interpreting data in a different way than the quote-unquote normal person. And whether that means that the neurons in the brain are firing differently, whether it means that they are kind of interpreting, you know, the input of, of stimulation differently, whatever it may be, it's considered kind of a divergent way of, of dealing with this input of data. Um, and so when you look at that, there is a huge spectrum uh, of this. And, and obviously, you know, we're just talking about two different things today. Um, but even within those um, kind of two different areas, there's lots of, of degrees there too. So, you know, there's, there's so much um, to be found kind of in this, this sub area of, of mental health and medical health um, that is really unique and interesting. Um, ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, um, you know, originally back there, it's gone through a lot of different kind of names for the condition. Um, you know, basically for a long time, this was just thought to be people that couldn't sit still. Yeah, maybe they had a hard time concentrating. You know, maybe they were more fidgeters when I was growing up. You know, these were typically the kids that were kind of quote unquote bouncing off the wall. Um, and there wasn't a lot of thought put into it. You know, maybe you had ADD, you know, if you couldn't concentrate, maybe you had ADHD if you couldn't concentrate and you were really hyperactive, whatever it may be, you know, and, and typically the medication prescribed at the time was Ritalin, it's a stimulant. And the thought basically is, you know, you're using a stimulant to kind of calm down what's going on. Um, times have changed we have learned a lot more about it we've learned that you know there's a broad variety of different treatments for patients with these conditions everything from medication to counseling dietary control a whole slew of stuff so it, once again there's you know time times change and so do treatments and diagnoses um typically though adhd um, was thought to be more of a condition that affected boys um you know but now we have learned that you know there definitely is uh, kind of a widespread um, prevalence of this condition among people of all genders. Um, and it is something that, um, you know, typically presents during childhood or adolescence, but it can persist through adulthood too. And so what we're seeing is actually a higher rate or higher incidence of adult ADHD now um, as we're getting better screening tools and things like that. From a gynecologic standpoint or from a hormonal standpoint, what kind of goes on is that you have episodes or periods of high amounts of hormonal fluctuations. And this goes back to one of the kind of less understood characteristics of estrogen, and then it acts as almost a neuroprotective type hormone. It's soothing to the neurons, to kind of activity that's going on there. Um, and so in times when um, estrogen levels very wildly, you can see manifestations or exacerbations of this condition. So puberty, postpartum, um, and, you know, menopause are the three main times in a over, you know, ovary owning person's life when they may notice exacerbations kind of of the symptoms. 
Um, and what's going on there is like, you know, with puberty, you have big ups and downs. Obviously, postpartum with pregnancy, you've had very high levels of estrogens in your, the body and then they collapse. And then with postpartum, or excuse me, with uh, menopause, obviously, things are really kind of taking a downward turn too. Those low levels of estrogen kind of make the, the neurons act more friable, more angry, more erratic. And so you have more um, prevalence of the symptoms where patients feel like they can't concentrate. They can't remember things. They have brain fog. They, um, you know, feel like they can't sit still. They don't rest well at night, whatever it may be. And, you know, for adults with ADHD, um, especially for those in, you know, professional careers, there have been coping mechanisms that have been created by those individuals, whether that's you take very, you know, um, detailed notes, you're a sticky note person, um, you put stuff on your phone, you know, you make little limericks or, or mnemonic devices to remember stuff, whatever it may be, you've been able to compensate and cope with, with those things in your own little way. Um, but once again, now that you have these hormonal changes, that shifts too. Um, and so those coping mechanisms may not work. The other thing that we see as well is that, you know, with patients with ADHD in general, the, their intrinsic dopamine, which is a neurotransmitter that's kind of our, ooh, I like that neurotransmitter, um, is less, there's less endogenous dopamine being produced. And so what that means is that that patient has to kind of get those dopamine hits from external stimuli. So, in, you know, instead of being able to say, oh, this is really interesting, I'm gonna kind of keep focus. It, this is now starting to get boring. Oh, look, that's a pretty light. Oh, that's a squirrel, whatever it may be that's doing that. And from a hormonal standpoint, testosterone has dopaminergic effects. And so the, what that means is that as testosterone levels kind of go up, you can have, you know, a, the, those intrinsic dopamine levels may be kind of higher or those dopamine receptors are kind of getting plugged more. Well, once again, in these periods of hormonal fluctuation or hormonal decline, testosterone is going to be going down as well. Because remember, the ovaries are the primary producer or the gonads just in general are the is, are the primary producers of testosterone um you know in the body and so if gonadal function starts to decline then you will see um te those testosterone levels start to go down too and that means less intrinsic dopamine which means that you may see exacerbations obviously of those symptoms now i think someone could do an interesting study and this may be have been done looking at you know boys with adhd and following up if their testosterone levels are lower when they're adults i don't know that's something to consider if you know the answer to that you know please put a comment you know below but that would be something to consider um, so what does this mean in terms of sexual functioning? Well, we know that eight patients with ADHD a lot of times have a higher rate of sexual issues. Typically, you may see that patients have a hard, harder time with arousal and then with orgasm as well. Um, you know, if you have a hard time kind of staying focused while you are doing, you know, sexual acts, whatever those may be, you may find that you kind of lose a little bit of enjoyment with them, that you have a hard time maintaining, you know, that aroused state. And then if you're having a hard time focusing on that, you may find that you have a hard time kind of with, you know, achieving orgasm. And so for that reason, actually a treatment for orgasmic dysfunction is the use of medications for ADHD. Um, you know, Adderall is, is documented for that we sometimes use Concerta, Vivans, like any of the newer ones, Ritalin too, you know, but basically the thought is that the patient then can focus more on what's going on at hand and so then they have an easier time achieving kind of that level of sexual satisfaction that they want to see. Um, from a hormonal standpoint, obviously, if you're going to have, you know, low sex drive, um, you know, especially in postmenopausal patients, that's often due to low testosterone levels. And like I said, you know, if you have a, a higher rate of ADHD because of lower testosterone levels, replacing testosterone may actually help not only with sexual function there, but also the ADHD type symptoms. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who has ADHD needs to be on testosterone, but um, it's something to consider if you have both of those issues, you know, your sex drive is lower and you deal with ADHD. Um, 
so yeah, so there, there's lots of interesting things there to, to look into. Um, like I said, definitely lots of research to be done. Um, but basically the, the take home message is, hey, if you know you have ADHD or you think you may have it, there are some really good screeners you can look at. And if, if you, you know, test kind of positive on that screener, I would definitely bring that to the attention of your, you know, your physician, your healthcare provider, whoever it may be, and talk about potential therapies for you. Because not only could it help your daily life, um, but also may uh, help your life in the bedroom too. Um, now kind of jumping into a different aspect of neurodivergence, the autism spectrum disorders. This is once again, a huge spectrum to where you have patients that are very kind of, you know, high functioning, but may just have a little bit of, of hyper focus in a specific area. Um, Osberger syndrome, um, you know, it, it kind of exists in this realm. Um, this was a, a condition where you have patients that tend to just get super focused on one specific thing and learn everything about that to the exclusion of other stuff. You know, when I was in medical school, we saw a video of a kid with Osberger syndrome and he was an expert in washing machines. He knew everything about washing machines, how they worked, all the history of washing machines. That's great if you ever get tested for washing machines, um, but not gonna help necessarily with a lot of other things. Um, and you can take that up to the end of the autism spectrum where you have patients that basically are nonverbal. Um, you know, any type of external stimuli can prove to be disconcerting for them. And that includes things like sounds, smells, tactile sensations from skin, like tags on the back of their shirt or whatever it may be. Um, and, and so, like I said, it, it's everywhere kind of in that spectrum. What we see from a sexuality side um, in terms of the autism spectrum disorder is a higher prevalence of patients with asexuality and also with hypersexuality, um, kind of two opposites there, but we also see a large amount of patients with gender um, nonconformance. And so they feel um, that they are born into a different gender than how they feel. And so they've looked at studies, and this is not just in the United States, but across the world, and it tends to be that a larger number of patients who identify as a different gender also fit someplace on the autism spectrum disorders. Um, so that's a really interesting kind of thing that, that more research needs to be done there to find out why is that. Um, but it's, like I said, something to, to know about uh, nevertheless. In terms of asexuality, obviously, um, you know, asexuality is a sexual practice in which people do not enjoy um, the act of actual sexual activity with others or themselves. This doesn't mean that they don't like to cuddle or touch or, you know, have emotional connections, but the actual physical act of sexual, you know, intercourse or sexual stimulation is not something that they care about really at all. Um, there is absolutely nothing wrong with being asexual at all. If that's, if you are asexual, let your asexual flag fly. There is nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, it's just something that we need to be more educated about kind of as a whole. Um, remember that with sexual um, concerns in general, as long as they are not affecting, or sexual practices, I should say, as long as it, it is not hurting somebody else or causing you to stress, then there's nothing to be ashamed about with that. That goes into, you know, asexuality, homosexuality, BDSM, you know, whatever it may be. Maybe you have a foot fetish, great, who cares? Like as long as it's not, you know, interfering with your, you know, ability to, to live a normal life um, and a life that you wanted to live and not hurting other people, cool. Um, hypersexuality, you know, these are typically individuals that are, you know, either have much higher drive to engage in either self-stimulation, which is often what we see in the autism spectrum disorder, or have stimulation with other people. And this can get into the realm of paraphilias, which are sexual um, health conditions that do cause distress in others. One of the most common ones we see in patients with autism spectrum disorder is a condition called frauderism. Um, and that's basically um, rubbing your genitals against Against someone else without their consent. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of times with hypersexuality and ASD, autism spectrum disorder patients, there is much, it gets involved more with kind of self-stimulation, masturbatory type activities. Um, these are things to once again be kind of aware of with um, these patients and to, you know, kind of help kind of direct them into when that activity is appropriate and when it's not. Um, obviously doing so in a caring and understanding fashion. Um, the big thing also that we look at from a hormonal standpoint with these patients is that once again, when they go through episodes of high hormonal fluctuation, 
you may have um, you know, significant exacerbations of your symptoms. So puberty, postpartum, menopause, those are the three big ones here, obviously for patients with ovaries. And so if you are the caretaker or the parent of a patient who has you know, very severe um, ASD, um, then that's something to be aware of. The other thing, you know, for patients who have um, autism, just in general gynecology, you really have to be careful when you're doing gynecologic exams, you know, to not cause more trauma. And so using either small speculums, making sure that they are kind of informed about what's going on if they can be, you know, do you need to do an internal vaginal exam? If the patient is not having any issues or if they are nonverbal and their you know, um, caretaker is not expressing any concerns or worries, you don't need to do a vaginal exam. They don't need a pap smear you know, for that. Like that that's, seems cruel and unusual. But if they do need something, you know, consider doing these types of exams under anesthesia. So they're not you know, distressed or stressed out by this, you know, the rate of sexual assault in patients who have any type of disability or with, you know, autism spectrum disorders like is much higher too. And so there may be traumas there, especially if they're in a center or someplace that, you know, multiple people are kind of interacting with them. So just things to kind of keep in mind. But anyway, like I said, lots of interesting topics here in neurodivergence and gynecology. The big take home message is hormonal fluctuations can cause exacerbations of symptoms. And especially in patients with ADHD, they may notice once they hit 30s, their symptoms kind of start to get a little bit worse. When they hit 40s, they definitely get worse. And there are lots of things we can do about that. So if you or someone you know is dealing with something kind of in this area, reach out, let us know at the Haven Center. Um, that's www.havencenter, American spelling of center.com because we're in the US. Um, and obviously, if you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. So have a wonderful rest of your day. I'll see you next week.